in Poland, yeah. Uh, and as I, told, as I told you, he was at uh, the University in Oslo, past which comes in December 2012. And what fascinated me, I mean, he did it, uh, uh, he uh, told us a little bit of the concept of, uh, about this in a night and evening talk in Oslo. And I was fascinated because it seemed like a crazy idea, but at the same time, there were really good people in the audience sitting there thinking like, how the hell are we supposed to be able to attack this? And with that, yeah. Thanks, Barry. Uh, you know, one of my big draws for me coming to Password 12 and now 15 is the people in the room are the people who are probably best apt to evaluate what I'm talking about and give me feedback. And uh, besides definitely promoting, trying to make this more of a discussion. And so uh, as we go through the slides, feel free to ask questions as we go and uh, pipe up and tell me what you think. Or if, if I didn't explain something right, I'll go back. And I really want to communicate sort of how this works, give you a really intuition about why it should work, and maybe, and then at the end we can have a little bit of discussion if we think this might actually change the environment at all, the threat environment for passwords. Um, how many, just to get a feel for the room, how many people have heard of blind hashing before or know anything about it? So uh, a few people, but a lot of new inductees, so that's good. Um, I mean, one thing which is blatantly clear is how hostile this environment is and has become and continues to evolve into. Um, I love this quote from James Comey of two kinds of companies in the U.S. Those who have been hacked by the Chinese. This is the original quote, but <laughs> those who have been hacked and those who just don't know they've been hacked. Um, and and really, you know, we look at um, a timeline of the big hacks, and it's like uh, it's a who's who. It's almost like if you haven't been hacked, you haven't. You're not there yet. <laughs> um, and this only goes to 2014. Uh, so the environment that we're in is almost like being hacked is the expectation. Um, and so the assumptions around how to protect the password file and what happens when that file leaks and what should users do about it and what do we try to push users into doing to, to deal with that reality has really sort of taken over the conversation around passwords. Um, but even the color, I think it's just year. Um, it says, yeah, bubble color is year and, and then the, the, the radius is the size of the attack. Um, the other option was method of leaks. But this is uh, world's biggest data breaches. If you Google that, you'll get to the link. Uh, it's really neat visualization. Um, I think that, uh, you know, despite how rampant password theft is, I still have this, uh, I'm still incredibly, incredibly uh, infatuated with passwords. I think that as a way to authenticate, as a way to encrypt, as a way to secure, you know, in the environment that we're in, where pretty much all of our data is being sucked up by third parties and commercialized and used against us in many different ways. Passwords are the one thing that you can keep in your head, you can share it with the breath. They really have these unique advantages. And if we can make passwords secure, there's all these really amazing benefits to society, I think, that can come out of having the ability to have a secure password that can't be cracked, particularly for uh, authentication and encryption. Um, and so this is why you know, I've spent the last few years trying to work on this idea of how can we... Uh, really change the the model of, of securing a password. Um, the cost to companies at this point um, has become tremendous. Um, you know, if, if you're a CISO, your job is on the line when that breach occurs, or even the CEO at this point, we've seen fire, you know, like in the target breach, the, the, the actual fall when these breaches happen, they have a really material impact on companies. And the, the people that I've talked to over the last couple of years, uh, they are very afraid of breaches. Um, and that fear is driving investment, and that fear is driving like a willingness to tr to try new things. Um, and so there's definitely an opportunity out there um, if there are new technologies, new approaches um, to to bring those to market. Um, I think there's there's definitely a recognition that the industry best practices don't really protect uh, users in the way that we want them to. Um, if you look at attack vectors, uh, we oftentimes separate out into online and offline. There's sort of a thing in the middle here with, you know, interception because, because of course the first thing we do with passwords is we send them in clear text from our browser to the server and hopefully through a protected channel. And so we're relying entirely on TLS, but there's so much that relies on that TLS that you can sort of take that out of the discussion for a minute. Because if TLS falls, it's not just your password that you're worried about. It's, it's really the world's on fire. So if you take out the interception, we have online attacks and offline attacks. And, uh, there's a paper, um, that Microsoft uh, research put out, and I think Carmen talked about it earlier uh, yesterday, uh, about 
there's a huge dichotomy here between um, the type of attack that can happen online and the type of attack that can happen offline. And that, they call that the online-offline chasm. Um, and there's a little bit of an eye chart, but you know, if we're looking at on the y-axis the risk of a password being guessed, and the blue line is an online attack and the orange line is an offline attack. Um, on the on the x-axis, it's log 10 guesses, guessability of the password, right? And that's also a big topic. And, and so the whole driving force is we push users to move their password to the right on that curve. Um, but what are we actually achieving when we do that? So in an online attack, um, if, if you've taken even basic precautions, and we've seen very no noteworthy news, you know, where, you know, like, for example, Apple had an API that wasn't rate limited. And people were able to exploit that to great effect. Uh, but if you can do some basic things on the server that are under your control, you can limit the online attack, the ability for an attacker to try to get the password through your actual login interface, right, um, to a fairly small number of attacks. Uh, but in the offline sense, once that hash is out of your control, or if it's password-based encryption, once that ciphertext is in the wild, there's nothing stopping somebody except for their time and money and the ability to uh, run that hash function. Uh, to try to crack that file. And so there's, you know, you can, you can, reasonable people can disagree about how far apart those curves are, but you're looking at six, eight, ten, maybe twelve orders of magnitude in the guessability, complexity requirements of a password to survive an offline attack versus an online attack. And so what, what really comes out of this is anytime the password database is locked, regardless of what kind of hashing is used, you just assume that all the passwords have been stolen. Uh, and this puts companies in a terrible position because Fundamentally, the perimeter is permeable. You cannot build a perfect perimeter that you can, you know, you can beat some of the people some of the time. You can't beat all the attackers all of the time. Zero days happen. Um, you know, exploits happen. And so the question is, how can we make it more resilient? How can we widen the attack window, uh, add a better opportunity to, to defend when those windows open up? So, you know, the limit of iterative hashing, and iterative hashing could be you know, uh, PBKDF2, Scrip, Bcrypt, or even, you know, we're, we're, whatever that hashing is doing, whether it's, you know, ultimately we're trying to use, the, we're trying to take the CPU and the I.O. and um, uh, the compute resources at your disposal and use them to the maximum capability so that ideally the attacker has to work approximately as hard as you worked to run the same hash. You know, an ideal hashing function doesn't give the attacker an advantage by switching uh, for example, over to an ASIC or an FPGA or a GPU, they can't they can't move to a different architecture and and, and beat you out on a dollars per hash uh, or a joules per hash basis, right? So, assuming we have this ideal hash, ultimately, what's the real limiting factor? Well, it's how long is the user going to wait to get that login to happen? Um, we have this like this hard limit, and you know Google might measure it in milliseconds, where between hitting enter on the login form and when you need to get that response back and start loading the next page. Um, and so any time we're trying to protect something in a run, you know, I call it runtime, which is, you know, while the user's logging in, um, you have this thing where you have this competing forces. Security increases with latency, but latency must be small. Uh, and so it puts an upper limit on how much cost can you put into the equation while the user's sitting there waiting. Um, and you have this arms race where ultimately over time, Moore's law will happen and these hashes are easier and easier to crack. Um, and so we're left with the only option left is we let's push the complexity of the end user because ultimately you have the multiplication. It's how hard was it to do one hash multiplied by the guessability of the password. So if we can move the guessability over, then maybe we'll give ourselves enough time to at least reset the password before the passwords get cracked. Um, and so now we see this huge push for complex password policies, unique passwords on every site. All of this comes out of the fact that we can't protect the password at rest. Um, and, and, and ultimately, the company's in this position where they have to just assume all is lost if that file's lost. So let's just talk about the goals of a, of a, a different kind of hash, hashing function. What would be a different way, a complementary way? And the, the idea here is something that works on top of what we're already doing. We're not trying to replace hashing, iterative hashing. We're trying to augment it with something which is uh, achieving a different kind of uh, cost factor. So we want to decouple it, ideally, from the entropy of the password. So right now, with runtime, Iterative hashing, it's very much entangled with the cost of the attacker depends entirely on uh, how complex the password is, multiplied by how much work you did at the, in that very limited runtime window. Um, so to securely store weak passwords, we need to get something where we can add cost independent of runtime. Um, ideally, we'd love to be able to say that an online attack is impossible, even if that database is popped 
even if there was a SQL injection or whatever, it lets people get access to the salts and hashes. And, and not like just impossible if your password is 22 characters, but um, I know that no passwords are going to be cracked, even though this breach happened. Um, we'd like to be able to prevent somebody from saying, well, I'm not going to steal your whole database, I just want this 64 bytes right here, and then I'm going to go attack, you know, Donald Trump and steal his money or whatever, right? Because I just have to crack his password, which is probably pretty simple, um, or whatever, right? So uh, you, you don't want them to be able to go in and bypass the cost. That, you know, you're putting all this cost into every user's hash every time they log in, and yet they can go to the weakest link and empty that person's account. Um, one absolute requirement is you can't, you know, there was a trend a few years ago where people sort of equated password hashing with crypto, and they said, oh, don't roll your own crypto. Well, don't roll your own password authentication. Leave it to the experts. Hand it over to Facebook or Google. Um, and we've seen a big pushback against that, and I think very rightly so, because um, when you hand over essentially the keys to your castle, you're handing over some very, very valuable, um, you know, user data. You're, you're, you're sort of subjecting the, the, the user to a privacy breach, but you're also handing over sort of, you never want to be in a position where you say, oh, is this user um, authenticated? And some, some third party says, yes, they are. You're like, well, how prove it? You know, you don't want to trust somebody else to say, this person should be let in. Was, was that the administrator? Oh, yeah, it was the administrator. Let them in. No, that, that's not okay. So you need, if you're going to use a third party, it has to be, in a sense, an untrusted third party to the degree that they can't make an invalid login look valid. Um, obviously, this has to be simple, and you know we've had years of work just to get people to do hashing and salting, uh, and it's still an ongoing uphill battle. Uh, and so, anything new or on top of this is going to, you know, be an incredibly difficult sell. Um, on the on the flip side of that, um, what's really interesting is in the last year we've seen data privacy become a competitive differentiator uh, for companies. So companies are willing to take the extra step, invest the money to get that if they can see. If they can see that it's real, if they can see that the technology provides like a real benefit, they'll invest the money into it and they'll say, okay, this is a competitive advantage for us to protect our users. Um, so the willingness for people to adopt is there. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, from a performance standpoint, no one's going to, no one's going to be willing to move the budget that window of, you know, Google wants that response in 20 milliseconds or whatever. There's a very limited budget to, um, to, to work within from a time perspective, latency wise. And I think, you know, uh, to cap it all off, the end user experience is so important. I mean, the the history of sort of password security is all about blaming the user. Um, and I blame, you know, I would like to have a technology where you can blame the service provider entirely and completely and say, if you lost that password, it's never the user's fault. Um, it's because you didn't do, the service provider didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, if you can put the onus on them entirely and give them a tool that lets them protect that, uh, those passwords, regardless of how weak or complex they are, from offline attacks specifically, then what you know? How does that change the world we live in? Um, you know, the, the side benefit is if you have a way to protect weaker passwords, you can spend a lot less money trying to get people to pick these complex passwords. Your support desk costs go down dramatically because you don't have passwords that people can't remember. The usability of passwords overall goes up. I mean, it, there's this huge uh, positive feedback loop if weaker passwords can actually be secure against offline attack. Um, and of course, you have to respect the end. If they're logging into site A, site A is the only person who can see their personal information. Um, so let's get to the point. Um, what is the blind hashing data for? Uh, literally, what we're looking at here is uh, kind of a brute force way to add cost into the system. And so we're going to do everything else the same as we would up until we get to the middle of this diagram. So user submits the credentials to the server. This is just a standard web form. Standard username and password coming over a TLS channel gets to the server. Uh, the server's going to run the same hashing function that they would ordinarily. Script, bcrypt, choose whatever hashing function you want. The key is that it has to be a salted hash, and salt should be uh, cryptographically secure random. Um, once you produce that hash, and we're going to I'll show a protocol diagram in a minute, which really steps through it. But once you produce that hash, you're going to send it to the blind, what I call the blind hashing data pool. And what the data pool will do is it'll use the hash as an index into a massive pool of completely random data. So literally, this this grid you see in the middle, imagine terabytes or potentially petabytes of random generated data. The data never changes. The password isn't being stored in this block. The block is static. Uh, it can grow over time, but it's maybe an append only. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the key is, imagine you know you take you take a perfectly secure pseudo random number generator and you fill terabytes of solid state drives with random data. Um, 
the hash points basically you use the hash as a way to point to decide which locations in the in the block to read from uh, and you collect those in at the bottom you hash that and you return it back and the server can use that response so it's 60 you can imagine say for example 64 bytes in 64 bytes out that's what's actually happening at 30,000 feet that response there's a second salt to another round of hashing, and then you save the value. So to look at pseudocode, um, username and password, you know, the site has a user's table, which has a salt one and a hash two. Okay, and these, these values are not, you can't get from A to point A to point B like you normally would if it was a salt and a hash. Um, when you do the first hashing function, you get an H1, you send that over in a function I'm calling get salt to the data pool. The data pool, um, uses it as a way to extract, decide which locations in the file to read from, um, collects it in the at the bottom, hashes that, sends it back to you. Um, there's an ID, if you can see it, um, which would uniquely identify either um, the site, the app, or the user, depending on the use case. Um, and what that lets you do is, that's just a token, another 64-byte random. That lets you do things like say, well, for this ID, um, I'm going to have a private key. That, that's the KID on the right side. The point. For this ID, I'm going to have a private key that, that basically keys the data pool for that site. So even though I only have one set of solid state drives with terabytes of data in it, um, when, when a site, when a certain site is using it to do a blind hash, that data looks unique to them. Um, if we throw away that key, that, that process can never be completed again because that data is no longer, you can no longer get the salt two from the hash one if we throw away that key. So this gives you a, a means for revocability. Talk about that in a second if I have time. Um, so one of the key aspects here is what does this actually mean to an attacker? So if we have this array of data and we um, get a lot of sites to come together and contribute to maintaining a very large array of data, um, we want to make sure that the attacker has to steal virtually all of it in order to crack even a single password, right? If they can steal a little bit of the data, and crack a little bit of the passwords, we're right back to where we started, which is, oh, I can do targeted attacks. But it turns out if you do these, multi every iteration that you use the hash to find, if you use the hash to generate an index to look into the data pool, every time you iterate it, and you, you're going to be looking at a uniformly distributed random location in the data pool. And so each one of those lookups is going to, if there's data missing, if the, if the hacker wasn't able to steal, the likelihood that you're going to point to a location that they don't have increases. And so you can imagine if they have 50% of the data pool, and you make one lookup, well, there's a 50 50 chance, right, that they're going to have the data. If you make two lookups, well, now you have to flip the coin twice and now it's a 25% chance. So it's an exponentially decreasing attacker advantage, is the way to, you know, to technically describe it. And, and you, you, you know, just by sort of eyeballing it, you can say, well, somewhere in the range of 32 or 64 lookups, we get into this location where the attacker now has to see virtually all of the data pool before they can crack even one in a million or one in a hundred million passwords. Um, because they wanted the data to even complete the function. And so now we've changed the cost factor, right? So now we live in a world where I can invest an arbitrary amount of money, right? I can take $10 million, I can take $100 million, and build a data pool that the attacker has to own all of, virtually all of, in order to crack a single password, even if the password's password. And that is a very different environment, because now if we can if we can get sites to band together and build this thing, there's a huge network effect, right? Instead of every site spending $1,000 trying to protect their password, uh, a million sites can spend, you know, we can, we can collectively spend some number of millions of dollars, build this service, and, uh, I think make offline attack is, you know, uh, basically a, a history. Um, there's a couple of details, um, to add additional functionality. So one of the things is, who would ever adopt this service if it meant that if the service went away that they wouldn't be able to authenticate their users? This is the first objection I would hear going into a company. I can't risk adopting this. Uh, because I don't know you're going to be around forever, and I, I don't want to reset all my users' passwords because the data pool gets corrupted. Um, so you you can you can basically escrow your hash one, keep a copy of your H1 encrypted with a public key that's online. Uh, it's important, you know. We heard about eight, um, we heard about like uh, RSA padding a couple talks ago in Greg's talk, but it's important that it's not a deterministic encryption, right? You 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 don't want it to just essentially be key stretching. Um, so uh, you do like an RSA pad, pad, random padded RSA, and you can keep the you can keep the hash one around. You keep the public key offline, um, like on a piece of paper in a vault somewhere. And if you ever need to get your H1 back, you bring the, you bring that private key online. You can you can re, you can recover your H1, 
And so this, this enables both the ability to peel back the blind hash, which gives you sort of, you know, lock-in protection, because who wants to get locked into the service? But also, it's, it's the ability, you, once you can re, once you can recover H1, you can now upgrade your hash and reapply the hash. Um, and so you can build a system between, between the, the, the public key that the site stores online and the private key that the data pool keeps. You can build this lockstep system where if either side gets breached, you can recover from the breach, recycle the key, and it's like it never happened. So you can get back, you can actually get back, you can rewind the clock, you can get back to a state where you know, without even resetting your user's passwords, that the passwords are safe again. Um, some of the interesting questions that come up is, for example, well, okay, this data pool, um, which we built, uh, built a 16 terabyte data pool that's actually running, and you can use the API and actually run this passing function. Uh, we've got a bunch of sites that are running it live in production today. Um, but obviously, you know, a certain size is never going to, is not going to be good for forever. And, you know, every three to five years, you're going to be doubling or maybe quadrupling the size of the data pool. So you need a way to grow it over time. Uh, there's a couple different, you know, two different ways that sort of come off the top of your head is one is you could just add to the end of it, generate new random data, stick it on the end, and then you just need to know when the hash was calculated, how big was the data pool then, and then how big is it now, and you can easily get back to the hash that you wanted. Um, the other idea is maybe uh, regenerating the pool and having like generations of blocks, and but that would require people to skip ahead, so that it requires more in, uh, interaction with the site, um, or else they might like you know, conceivably be left behind with hashes that, that are pointing to a data pool that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and one last thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, uh, using uh, passwords for encryption, and there was a great talk last year Jeff gave about. Uh, he talked about the, uh, the cable gate, the wiki the cable gate. It was an awesome story. In five seconds, basically, the idea was they, they, they put the cipher text on BitTorrent, uh, in like 2010 or something. And in 2011, the book came out that had the password for it. And there was this big effort to sanitize the cables and not leak all, you know, sensitive information. But in the end, it was useless because once the password leaked, people who had the cipher text, they were able to decrypt it. And so there's this notion that once the cipher text is out there, it's gone forever. And, and that password is now at risk, right? I mean, uh, and, and, and the other interesting thing is, uh, I, I've covered them up in case people want to guess because it's kind of a fun game. So, GNU PG, if you're using in, uh, password based encryption, you're using GNU PG with the defaults of the command line. What do you think the KDF is? How many rounds and what hashing functions? Does anybody know? Jeff knows. If you want to guess, you know, how many rounds, of, let's say it's PBKDF2, how many rounds of, uh, of uh, iterations of so, so GNU PG by default is six, is, is two of the sixteenth iterations of SHA one. Okay, so this is like you know, seizure raising hands, and maybe they changed this since I googled it. <laughs> and then one iteration of SHA one. Oh, okay. So it's you know this is like easy to crack type of realm, right? Let's just do a couple more really quick because it's just, so SSH keygen, right? SSH keygen. This is your this is the keys to your kingdom. Gets you into the server, right? Up until 2013, end of 2013, what was the KDF? One round MD5. We have a winner. One iteration of MD5 to protect your SSH key. Up until the through the end of 2013, and even now the default they changed it, but only for if you're using um, um, uh, elliptical curve. How about? Yeah, I, don't, I can't. The number is blanking, but you know, it's a. Uh, how about uh, TrueCrypt, which is now it's Veracrypt, and they improved it in Veracrypt. But what was TrueCrypt? You know, the gold standard of keeping my of an encrypted file system. If anyone did crack which you can, they would know, right? How many iterations of a KDF was it using to try to protect your password? Two thousand iterations of MD160, and there was another. Uh, there was a user interface choice, and one of them would only give you a thousand iterations. Yeah, EcryptFS is something Ubuntu uses for encrypted partitions. 65. This one's not too terrible. 2 to the 16 of at least a shot by 12. So, I mean, the, the moral of the story is when you encrypt with even the best practice tool, you have to be extremely careful of, okay, well, what's happening with my password to turn it into a key? And how practical is this? How much entropy do I need in the password? And, and obviously, once, it's, once, the, once the ciphertext is out there, like we heard from Greg, it has everything you need to crack it. So you can use blind hashing as a KDF. Um, if you if you run your hash your KDF, if you add a, a blind hashing step into the process of deriving the key, you've now turned it into an online process. So now decryption of say my hard drive, 
although it will require an internet connection, uh, is revocable. I can go to the blind hashing service and say, destroy the private key that corresponds to that app ID. Um, or I can say, when you try to decrypt my password, when you try to complete the KDS step to generate my key to decrypt my laptop, I mean, send me a text message and give me a two-factor authentication. So you can start doing all these really interesting things with encryption that's still fully within the control of the end user. Um, and so there's a whole unexplored, uh, mostly unexplored territory of uh, like an online KDS, a network KDS that give the user more control. Um, so I just want to advancing, advancing. There we go. So you know, going back to that original diagram, imagine what a world would look like without offline attacks. That would be boring. <laughs> I mean, if we can truly add a cost level that puts an offline attack out of the reach of the uh, of the criminal elements that are using it to ultimately make money, right? That's the reason people do it. They do it to make money off the password. If it costs more to crack the password than you can make, well, a lot of people do it for the pain. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you can eliminate the, the financial motive, um, and potentially eliminate even the feasibility of it, if you can if you can get your head around how big of a data pool that might take. What does the world look like where we only have to worry about online attack efforts? And that's, that's an interesting world. So um, that's my passion. I'd love to hear your question. Uh, where do you store this 16 terabyte of data, and how do you plan to access it, and how do you scale it? It's a great question. So at, at home, is it? yeah. So we're, we're right, you know, right now we have a data center in San Jose, it's co-located equipment, and a data center in Dallas, and we have two copies of the data. And of course, you can't just have 16 one terabyte drives. You need redundancy within a rack. You need redundancy across rack. Um, there's a lot of considerations as far as you know. You need to securely generate the data. You need to make sure that you can verify the integrity of the data. You want you want to know at the application layer that the data has you know that some sort of bit error didn't occur because obviously the blind hashing service would have no idea if the random data change. So you need checksums that go all the way up to the application level. Uh, but the really interesting property is the bigger you make the data pool, the more solid state drives you add, the more iOS per second the system can sustain. And so you get this, you know, whereas in the previous world, um, security sort of increases as performance decreases. Now we have a situation where security increases and performance increase um, in concert. So it's, 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 a, it's a really interesting uh, environment. So like a, a 16 terabyte, uh, 24 disk array can usually do 100,000 blind hashes per second at, you know, 5 milliseconds per blind hash with 64 lookups for each blind hash. So, you know, you multiply it out. These drives, this, this technology wouldn't really be possible with, with spinning rust, but with solid state, um, it's just really, it, it opened up the possibility to use not IO, but actual disk, you know, actual bits as a cost factor. Um, yeah, very cool. Quick one, last one. So I, I, I feel like there's maybe something I'm not getting here, but I'm aside from the, the size and the cost of, of these uh, uh, terabyte arrays, it, it kind of has this feel sort of like you're using them like a one-time pad, except they're not using them one time. And so it, it, to me, it just seems like you take something like an HSM and use it to generate the, uh, to, to use the, you know, you take the, the, the raw salt, Process it through an HSM and come up with a secret salt that you use. And is that um, it? Effectively, is an HSM. Um, it acts the same. And the question is, what's your you know what's your trust level in that hardware, and uh, what's your confidence that it can't be stolen? So I think that using data as a dimension of um, you know like for example RSA Secure ID was was an H and, and they lost the key and all those devices were effectively compromised. And so, you know, there's something about the ha having a half of petabytes of data, I think, that changed the equation of, you know, this isn't going to be attacked over the network. Uh, if it takes, for example, you know, 64 bytes in, 64 bytes out to do one blind hash, you can look at the network and you can say, well, if I want to support 10,000 blind hashes a second, it only works out to X number of bits, bytes per second that I would ever expect to see over the line. Uh, if I, if I multiply that by the, divide that by the size of the data pool, you say, oh, well, at full line rate, it's going to take them 800 days to download this file of the network. It just changes the attack window. So if there's a vulnerability in HSM, somebody could come in, steal the key, and go, right? If there's a, if there's a vulnerability, and there will be, uh, to the data pool, they can maybe start sip siphoning it out, but the simple heft of the data, you know, will give you time to react. And if they can't get all the data, they've achieved nothing. 
Thanks very much, guys. <laughs>